All right, folks, we are about to get this show on the road. We're currently live on YouTube, and we're going to get this thing started in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Adventures Club Thursday Night Programs. Uh, the applause that you just heard is because we are open for the first time since COVID started last year, and uh, we actually have a fairly full room tonight. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, Dr. W uh, Robert Williscroft, He's an author and uh, quite a few other things on the list, which I'll let him tell you about rather than me. Robert, th welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could be at the club personally. Well, we're going to get you out here in June, I understand, so <laughs> we'll be glad to have you. So um, we'll get into all the juicy stuff about your books and uh, your experiences in diving, uh, but can you give us a little bit of background on yourself uh, that led up to all of this interesting stuff? Well, my background started uh, with my parents who went to German Poland before World War II, escaped by the skin of their teeth, ended up in Montana as uh, ministers uh, in eastern Montana where I was born in 1942. Uh, in 1950, they decided to go back to Europe and uh, took myself and my sister back. There was no place to live in Germany. It was all bombed out, and so we found a, uh, they found a place in Basel, Switzerland, where I spent a year, and then we moved to Germany, and I grew up in Germany, went to high school, and graduated, and uh, started my college there, and finally came back to the States, uh, and not very long after that, found myself an enlisted submarine sonar technician. Uh. Uh, those of you who've seen the movie or read the book, Hunt for Red October, will be familiar with Jonesy, yes. a precocious uh, sonar technician. The main difference between him and me was that he had dark skin and I've got light skin. Other than that, we were pretty much alike. Anyway, uh, I ended up getting lucky, was selected for a commissioning program, uh, was sent to the University of Washington where I was educated in marine physics and atmospheric physics, and then I went back into the submarine service as a commissioned officer and was actually the Navy's first Poseidon weapons officer. The track that the Navy put me on, and those of you who are ex-military understand that the needs of the service always come before the needs of the individual, uh, they needed to have weapons trained, nuclear missile trained officers and they didn't much care whether the officers wanted to be on a track to have command of a ship or a submarine. Uh, I was put on that track, and so I was not able to uh, be in line for command on a nuclear submarine. As a result, I uh, volunteered for Vietnam to get out of submarines and found myself uh, at the Defense Language Institute in El Paso, Texas, learning Vietnamese. By the time I was fluent in Vietnamese, the war was over, <laughs> and the Navy was trying to find a place to put me. <laughs> well, uh, I was temporarily parked at a recruiting station there in El Paso, and my skipper was an old ASR, a, a submarine rescue ship skipper, who had the in on lots of things that were going on that nobody knew about. Uh, we got to know each other and liked one another, and he found out that I was interested in the Man in the Sea program, and the next thing I knew, uh, I was on my way to Navy Diving School, Saturation Diving School, and ultimately uh, became the officer in charge of something called the Test Operations Group. Now, those of you who are ex-military will know that the military could come up with some really arcane uh, nomenclatures for things that they do. The Test Operations Group was code for lock out of submarines on the ocean bottom and tap into Soviet underwater communications cables. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned uh, saturation diving. For the benefit of people who don't know what that is, can you uh, give us some information around that? Sure. Um, 
I'm going to assume that a lot of you, perhaps a, a uh, majority of you have been diving at one time or another. So you have some sense, some understanding of what diving is all about. Uh, Jacques Cousteau invented the aqualung, at least uh, he got credit for inventing the aqualung. And what it does is supplies air from a pressurized tank to your lungs at the pressure of the surrounding water. Uh, what happens when you breathe air, as you all are doing right there at approximately sea level, uh, your body becomes saturated with nitrogen uh, at, uh, at uh, sea level pressure, at the partial pressure of nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere at sea level. When you dive down to a depth, say 33 feet, that's a full extra atmosphere. If you stay down there for a while, your body becomes saturated with nitrogen at two atmospheres, the atmosphere that's up above the water plus the atmosphere created by the 33 feet of the water. The deeper you go, the more nitrogen soaks into your system. Once you get down to about 200 feet or so, nitrogen becomes very narcotic and oxygen becomes toxic. So at that stage, if you're gonna dive any deeper, you have to replace the nitrogen with something that isn't narcotic, and that happens to be helium. And it turns out that if you dive to great depths, uh, hundreds of feet, a thousand feet, uh, with helium as the inert gas, uh, you end up with something called helium tremors. And uh, we figured out that by adding a little bit of argon, a very tiny little bit to the atmosphere, you could get rid of the tremors. So saturation diving basically is you get into a in, into a deck decompression chamber, a diving chamber. You press down to the depth you're going to be diving at, and then you you lock into a, a bell that will take you down to that depth if you're functioning from a surface ship, uh, and then you can dive out of the bell and stay down there as long as you want. Come back into the bell under pressure. Come up, transfer back into the chamber, and eat, sleep, take a shower, do whatever, and you can continue working, at maintaining the pressure that you're at until it's time to come back to the surface. Uh, and then you uh, decompress just one time. Now, when I was down at 1,000 feet, it took us uh, almost 10 days to decompress back to the surface, give you some sense of what it's all about. Huh. And that's not a fun place to spend all that time either, <laughs> I imagine. You get used to it. Right. So these are these are pretty cramped quarters, aren't they? Well, the uh, the uh, the chamber that we used when I was down on the thousand foot dive was about yeah, it was about thirty feet long and eight or nine feet wide, maybe ten feet wide. It was divided uh, into two places. There were four bunks inside. We had a table where we could play cards and. Uh, we could, uh, and that was way before the days of uh, digital technology, but they could shine a movie through one of the ports to a screen we could set up inside. So we were able to watch movies uh, <laughs> during our decompression phase. <laughs> Hopefully you had a choice over the movies they showed you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones we wanted and the ones they showed us were really quite different. <laughs> I can tell you that one of the uh, one of the guys had a particularly attractive girlfriend, and after we had been down there for a while, uh, she came in to the uh, to, to the uh, the room on the vessel where the chamber was, uh, and uh, opened up her blouse uh, in front of the port. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was pleasant or torture. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about uh, dive school and about the, the deep water diving that you did during training. And Well, you've all seen uh, video clips of Navy SEAL training. There's a lot of physical exertion and the guys learn to depend upon one another teamwork wise. Uh, saturation diving training is very much like that except the focus isn't so much an armed soldier who's able to function in the air and in the water and under the water, but rather the focus is on somebody who is 
operating at extreme pressure under ex circumstances that require sharp wit, intelligence, the ability to think when everything is going wrong. So there's a lot of intellectual uh, training that goes along with it, uh, including a thorough theoretical understanding of how saturation diving works insofar as we all understood it. Okay. Uh, Ivy, Operation Ivy Bills. <laughs> I've been reading the book. It's uh, fascinating. Um, but you were involved in the real thing. It's yeah, based I was. on true story. So uh, tell us how that came about and uh, your role in it. And uh, well, let, me, let me give you a little bit of background first. Okay. Uh, a naval officer and his son were out on Chesapeake Bay on a Sunday afternoon doing some fishing. And he happened to notice on shore there was a sign with an arrow pointing down and it said, a cable crossing, do not anchor here. He got to thinking about that and he said, you know, uh, I'll bet you that over in Soviet waters, they have similar things because they use underwater cables just like we do. No reason to go all the way around the bay when you can go across the bottom of it. And the only difference would be that it would be in uh, Russian Cyrillic rather than uh, in English letters. And he began to think about it and he said, you know, I bet we could go and find those things. We might even be able to tap into a underwater communications cable if we gave some effort to it. Well, he talked this around uh, and slowly the concept worked its way up until people who had the ability to move mountains uh, came to understand what it was all about. Now, uh, when the thresher went down, when the, when the submarine thresher was sunk, uh, a program was initiated that was designed to rescue people from down submarines and this was looked at, and, and basically what the Navy said, and this, this was just a very small number of people, they said, you know, our submarines operate in waters that are typically greater than 10,000 feet deep, and there's no way if a submarine goes down that it's going to be uh, rescued. But it's a feel-good thing, and you know something? If we created a system where we had deep submergence rescue vehicles, and we could, uh, we could make a system that was real, that we could actually demonstrate that it works, we could put these DSRBs on the backs of submarines, and we could put them on motherships, catamaran motherships, and, and show that they really work, then what we could also do is take something that looked like a DSRB and put it on the back of a specially outfitted submarine, except it would be a saturation diving chamber. And then we could take that submarine out to sea and everybody, including the bad guys, would think that it was just another DSRB exercise when in fact the submarine could go into, for example, the Sea of Okhotsk between the Kamchatka Peninsula and Northern Siberia. And we could, from a submerged basis using our periscopes, look for that silly sign that says, uh, don't anchor here, cable crossing. <laughs> and when we saw the sign, then we could go down to the bottom and put the divers out, and we could tap into the damn thing. And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> so how long, uh, how long did it take to prepare for this mission? And then uh, once you left the U.S., how long did it take to actually get there and perform all of it? Well, that, that's a series of, of complicated questions to answer. It took several years to put together this absolutely, completely functioning cover story of the DSRVs and the flyaway systems and the motherships. And incidentally, I served as an officer on both of the motherships too. Um, but once it was together and it was time for the USS Halibut, which used to be a guided missile, uh, a guided missile submarine and was converted over to uh, handle this task. Uh, she could only travel uh, just a bit over five knots uh, with the chamber on her stern. <laughs> so leaving from Mare Island, San Francisco Bay basically, and crossing the Pacific uh, over uh, moving around the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula and, 
and up into the Sea of Okhotsk, that, that took well over a month. And then the search took quite a while until the cable crossing was found. Then an experimental tap was put on the cable to see whether the concept would work. When we found that it worked, uh, we, we had some serious problems keeping the submarine properly anchored. And let me diverge just slightly here. At one point, the Sea of Okoska is a real, real stormy place. And at one point, uh, the submarine had a bow anchor and a stern anchor so that uh, the lines were leading aft and forward and the submarine was actually moored uh, about 20 to 30 feet off the bottom. And storm waves were so ferocious, the water was 410 feet deep there. The storm waves were so ferocious that it rocked the submarine around and broke the forward cable. Uh, that, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> the divers were out when that happened. And what, what everybody decided at that point was that we had to go into the yards uh, at Guam, which is, uh, as you know, quite a way south uh, of the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula, and have skids put on the bottom of the sub so that she could sit on the bottom for future operations. So uh, we traveled to Guam, which took another month, and then uh, got the skids put on and received the 12,000 pound uh, skid, uh, the, the 12,000 pound pod, which, was, which, was, which we then took back up and actually put on the cable. And that recorded on tape, believe it or not. Uh, and then periodically, uh, submarines, our submarine, and there were a couple of others, the, the Apache and the Sea Wolf were involved in this, and they would come in and divers would go out and literally get the old tape, the one that had all the recordings on it, and put a fresh one in. And so so they changing out the VCR. <laughs> they very much like that, yeah. Underwater at 400 feet. Yes. So I, I presume they... <laughs> How do you protect a, a device like that so you can open it up and take something out? I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had waterproof modules that yeah, plugged and unplugged. Exactly. Interesting. And battery powered? Yep. So they changed the batteries also? Yep. Oh, interesting. So um, you have a, uh, I think you have the halibut in your background there. I do. Yes, you can see the halibut. You can see the, the dome on the front, that hump, is where the uh, guided missiles used to be fired from. Uh, that was left there because it was an integral part of what was called the bat cave. And down inside the bat cave is where the uh, spooks operated. They had a UNIVAC computer there, and they analyzed the data that we got during the first leg when we did the proof of concept. Hmm. And then the, uh, there's a... Uh semi-spherical or cylindrical piece on the tail? Yep, that is, the, that, that is exactly what the DSRV looks like, except that isn't the DSRV. That is the uh, saturation uh, recompression chamber. Uh, that, that's the one that has the four beds in it and, and uh, the ability to lock out. So this is where your team lived? Well, they were under pressure. They, yeah. they, they, they didn't mind yeah, only under pressure. <laughs> being under pressure, but it was it was nice to uh, to come out and when, when you're under pressure, you know this was at 400 feet. Uh, at 400 feet, a steak tastes like cardboard. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich tastes like cardboard. <laughs> Strawberry shortcake tastes like cardboard. Everything tastes like cardboard. <laughs> so it was nice to get out of there and and have something that didn't taste like cardboard. I saw the note that the, the crew liked the spicy fried chicken because it had some semblance of flavor to it. <laughs> some semblance, yeah. <laughs> it tasted like spicy cardboard. <laughs> so in the, uh, in the bat cave, what was, what was in there? Uh, well, mostly... You said a univac, which probably... Yeah, there was a univac computer. <laughs> and uh, something called the basketball was operated out of there. It was a little ROV 
that was maneuverable in three dimensions. And it was called a basketball because it was just slightly larger than a basketball. It had uh, floodlights on it. And it was, it was able to observe what the divers were doing and could help control them and, and point them in things that they had to do, things they, couldn't, they didn't necessarily see themselves because they're operating in pitch black. And anytime there was storm activity, uh, the bottom was silty and it was silt up. And sometimes you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Sure. And there's a, there, there is a, uh, in, in the pictures that you've got, there are a couple of pictures of that uh, showing uh, all their drawings, but it, it shows the, um, the basketball observing the divers and, and putting the pot in place and a couple of other th things that they were doing. Huh. Well, it looks like uh, we're running there some we of the... Go. Graphics. And then the one that's showing right now, uh, let's see. I got to stop talking so I can see it. It's too small to see on my screen right now. Huh. Well, okay, I'll try to describe it. <laughs> it looks like something out on a tether or. Uh... Okay, I see what that is now. That. And at one point, the, the, the divers found that they, they, were, they were over in an area where Soviet missiles were, test missiles were fired, and then they fell into the water and broke up and fell on the bottom. And we were out there salvaging the pieces from the bottom and to take back for a CIA analysis. And apparently, uh, the Soviets got wind that something was going on, and they sent one of their ships with divers uh, and a diving bell. And the book describes in detail how, the, how we overcame the Soviet divers and were able to capture one of them. A couple were killed in the process. And uh, uh, this shows that diving bell on its side and uh, a couple of the divers. And you see the, um, the basketball uh, shining a light on what's going on there. Uh, so the basketball was tethered. Yeah, I presume. Yeah. Okay. So you, you guys had a actual encounter battle with the guys underwater. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the there were there were actually two encounters. One at that point, and then as the uh, halibut was leaving for the final time, as she was leaving the uh, Sea of Okhotsk, uh, she was going out uh, under a trawler. Uh, a, a trawler that we had that uh, the Navy had sent there specifically to mask the submarine leaving, and uh, there there ended up being a confrontation with divers out of an old Soviet whiskey submarine uh, uh. that turned out to be kind of exciting. <laughs> I'll bet. Well, I'm gonna have to get around to the rest of the book, obviously. <laughs> so. Um, this was a series, if I understand it, there was a there was a proof of concept trip that you did, and then the the real one was done on a return trip. That is correct. The proof of concept we actually did live recordings, um, which was one of the main reason why the Univac computer was in the back cave, and it was during that trip that the cable broke, and we realized our anchor cable broke, and we realized that we needed to put skids on the bottom of the sub in order to settle down, make ourselves really heavy sitting on the bottom so that we could function properly. Because manipulating that 12,000 pound pod was, uh, was no mean trick and, and it required stability. And so the submarine went back to Guam, uh, got the modifications made to it, and then came back into the Sea of Okotsk uh, with the skids and the pod, and then this pod was installed permanently on the underwater communications cable and tested to make sure it worked. And then uh, periodically, fairly frequently, the subs came back and pulled the data out until uh, a, uh, re a chief petty officer named Pelton yeah. working uh, in the submarine security back on the East Coast got himself into debt uh, as, as I understand it, he had $65,000 of debt. And at that time, that was about $200,000 of our current money. 
And he uh, approached the Soviets and told them that he knew an awful lot about this secret operation. And uh, while he didn't give them documents, he had a good memory and he gave them the information verbally. And they went out and started, they, they of course knew where their cable was and they started dragging across the cable and uh, with anchors and, and pulled the cable up and took the pod uh, and if you were to go to the Moscow Maritime Museum today, you'd see the pod sitting there. Huh. Interesting. Now, did, uh, about how many? So this was out there, I think, almost 20 years? or The was pod was not that long, no. The program itself ex existed for about, in fact, there's good reason to believe that similar things are being done now, although not in the Sea of Okotsk. Hmm. Uh, but we've developed the capability for doing this in other parts of the world. Um, the uh, the uh, halibut is gone. The sea wolf, the old sea wolf is gone. The parchy is gone. But Jimmy Carter's out there. And uh, Jimmy Carter, the submarine, is especially designed to take care of things just like this. Huh. Uh, and she's also designed to bring Navy SEALs in for, for littoral operations. But... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's stuff not going on right now. Hmm. So, about how many times in the in, during in a year would uh, would they go change out the tapes and batteries? Oh, every month. Wow. So, wow, you had a team going in once a month into Soviet-controlled territory doing this. This yeah. is this is considered their their stuff there. So when you had, uh, was there uh, surface encounters? I mean, when they, once they detected that you were there, were there things going on on the surface or was it just other submarine? Yeah, there, there, there was a lot going on on the surface. The, the Soviet uh, submarine technology at that time was pretty primitive. Uh, Soviets had nuclear subs, but they had reactor problems and they, I don't think that they considered the problem serious enough that they wanted to take one of their nukes and put it into the Sea of Okotsk. But they did put a whiskey submarine, an old diesel submarine in there. And the, while the diesel submarine has to, has to function on the surface or near the surface so that it can use a snorkel to, to run its diesels, uh, it was pretty effective. And uh, we were amazed at how how uh, how expertly the Soviet skipper was able to figure out where we might be. Um, he he understood tactics very well. The Soviets also had a couple of high end uh, cruisers with tow to ray sonars that that they were using to sweep through the Sea of Okotsk and try to see what might be down on the bottom. Um, in the book, I describe an incident where we ended up placing ourselves directly beneath one of the cruisers, uh, just a few feet below his keel, uh, so that he, it would be impossible for him to find us because he was getting too close to where we didn't want him to be and we wanted him to move off. Anyway, it, it worked out well and it's described in detail in the book. Hmm. I read that part. That was very exciting. <laughs> Probably less exciting <laughs> until afterwards where you're concerned. <laughs> you know, the thing, the thing that I think everyone in the club will understand is that um, we were getting paid to do this and man, can you imagine that? I mean, we would have paid to do it, but people were willing to pay us to do it. So that was really cool. <laughs> you, you use a phrase in your, in your book. I think it was, uh, something about, uh, long periods of sheer boredom. Yeah. <laughs> Submarining can be defined as endless hours of, Sheer boredom interrupted by moments of sheer panic. <laughs> and when you combine that with saturation diving, it is very definitely uh, that that's the routine that you live with. Yeah. 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 The, the discipline in all of that and the combination of it just seems amazing to me. Uh, you have to keep your wits about you <laughs> at all times. 
One of the, one of the things, if you could talk a little bit um, in reading, and it, I guess it never really occurred to me that much, but as I was reading about um, driving a submarine, <laughs> you know, I, you think in terms of ships, uh, surface craft and whatnot, and there's so many other aspects to uh, manning a submarine and navigating around. And I was wondering if you could speak to some of that. Uh, the first, yeah, the first thing you got to realize is that you're working in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And if the water is sufficiently deep, your depth is not limited to the bottom. You have a depth beyond which you can't go because the submarine will implode. There's something called test depth, which is the deepest you're supposed to go. And then there's something called crush depth, which is the deepest you can go, except if you do, you're not going to come back. <laughs> and so, some gray area in between. <laughs> and some gray area in between. Uh, now, in addition to the in addition to the three dimensions, unlike an aircraft, when you when you push your right foot down. Uh, on the pedal in, in the aircraft and and the, the, the plane reacts quickly. Everything goes right now. On a submarine, uh, when you say right full rudder, uh, the submarine slowly begins to turn right. When you, when you put a down angle on the submarine in order to dive, the submarine slowly takes the down angle. Uh, and you have to be thinking ahead as to what you wanted to do next so that you can give the order for that next operation in a timely way so that it happens when it needs to happen. Otherwise, you're gonna bump into things. You don't have any vision, all you have is sound. And when you're operating stealthily, you don't make any sound, all you have is ears, you listen. So, uh, it, it's a question of knowing where you are, trusting your charts, being careful, and training, constant, constant training. When I, when I had the deck watch, when I was the officer of the deck, uh, we, we set it up so that each watch period, one of the watch standards would show up with a scenario in mind that, and he would give us the symptoms of what happened and then we would have to try to solve it while we're running the ship, while we're doing what we have to do. We try to solve the problem that that watch standard presented to us. And every single watch period, we did this so that, so that the guys came up with some of the most interesting uh, exercise, what if kinds of situations. And every once in a while, one of those would happen for real, but we had practiced it and we knew what to do. So, and that's not just limited to the submarine. I, you were doing this with your dive team as well. In the... That's right, we were. And it paid off in, in one case in particular. Um, and there's a, there's a, one of the drawings shows this, but the halibut was on the bottom and the whiskey submarine had bottomed not that far from the halibut. Uh, mm. And what we, what we did was sent one of the guys over uh, to the whiskey submarine uh, with the idea of wrapping some cable around his stern planes and his propeller, propellers, <laughs> yeah, propellers in such a way that when he tried to maneuver, he would be forced to the surface and have to limp somewhere to get himself fixed. And when, the, uh, when, the, when our diver did this, he managed, he was on an umbilical, a long umbilical um, from from the fake DSRV on the back of the halibut, somehow he got himself wrapped up in a in one of the um, lifeline the one of the lifelines on the deck of the uh, whiskey submarine, and when the whiskey started to go to the surface, he would have gone along with it because the cable would have pulled him up, the, the uh, lifeline would have pulled him up, and what he had to do was to cut through his umbilical. Wow. And then he had to pull himself, he, he had a little uh, come home bottle on his belt that at that depth had about five breaths of air in it, five breaths of, uh, of not air, but a uh, mixed gas. He had to pull himself hand over hand along the, the umbilical 
uh, back and, and make it back and, and do it in the time he had remaining or he was going to die. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, the come home bottles don't get you very far. <laughs> that's, a, that's the same mix. It's a helium oxygen mix. Yeah. Uh -huh. You have to pre-mix it for the depth you're going to be diving to. And because you have a, when you're, when you're saturation diving, uh, you have a ceiling above you. You can't go above that ceiling. There's a little bit of slop. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't such that if you go one inch above, you're going to die. There, there's, there's some, there's some, uh, there, there's a certain amount of flexibility and it's built into the Navy saturation diving tables. Um, but you're limited to an, an envelope. You can't, you can't go deeper than a certain depth. In our case, it was the bottom because that's where we were. And you couldn't go more than about 40 feet above the bottom. So you, you had that envelope and that was it. And so we'd mix the gas uh, in the come home bottles to, to match the average depth. And that's what the guys would take with them. Hmm. Interesting. So now... You've done, we've talked quite a bit about this adventure, but uh, you have other books. You've done some diving in the Arctic. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I spent a total of three years up in the Arctic ice pack. This was after I left the Navy and uh, became associated with NOAA. I, I transferred my commission into NOAA, the NOAA Commission Corps, hmm. and we were up up in the Arctic in a program called the Outer Continental Shelf Assessment Program. It was OXEP. It was basically a way of setting a baseline, a biological, ecological baseline, so that should some kind of a disaster happen up there, we would know what it was before the disaster and could bring things back to that zero point. Uh, and part of that involved diving under the ice, and that's that was quite an interesting experience. Uh, we, there are a couple of pictures uh, in, the, in the set where you can see the ship in the ice pack, you can see the helicopter, and, and I think there are even a couple of pictures showing the divers either in the water or going, going into the water from the, from the ice uh, flows. Uh, so when you... We flew, we flew 100 kilometers. Well, there, there you go. Whoops, that went pretty fast. Um, the one you're looking at there is me, and let me explain what was going on there. Uh, we were capturing seals, uh, baby, baby seal pups, tagging them, weighing them, uh, and cataloging them, and then letting them go. And we had been looking for a ring seal pup for a long time, and finally uh, our guide saw one off in the distance, and we were out in a Boston whaler, uh, headed between the ice pieces, and I got up on the bow of it, and as we hit the ice flow, ice, and of course, the, the Boston whaler stopped, and I slid off onto the ice with my arm stretched and captured the little guy. <laughs> and he was all teeth and claws, and you, got, you, you cannot believe how sharp the claws are on a baby seal. My goodness, it's 10 meters. In any case, I took him and, and sat down on the ice and put him in my lap, and I think for the first time in his life, he felt warmth. And <laughs> I could just see the little guy saying, hey, this isn't, this isn't all that bad. Yeah, and I might, so, might hang a while. <laughs> and as you can see, I'm holding him there, and he's, he's got the bill of my hat in his mouth. And we tagged him and, and weighed him, and, and Mama was just frantic. She was barking. There was a hole in the, in the ice flow. And she would stick her head up through the hole and, and just yelp at him. And, and the baby was paying no attention to mama. And when I put the baby <laughs> down on the ice and started walking towards the Boston whaler, the little pup is following me instead of going to mama. <laughs> well, finally, she got up there and grabbed him and pulled him down through the hole. And that's the last we saw of him. But... Yeah, I got, got a whooping when he got home. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when you said uh, you were doing research to kind of baseline in case of, in the event of disaster or an event, what kinds of things are you talking about when you say that? Well, uh, the, uh, the seal pup uh, capture and release was part of it. We captured birds, 
uh, seals, walruses. Uh, we would take uh, a male and a female of each species, uh, and we had biologists on board who would do a stomach analysis and find out what they ate, what, what, the, what their predominant food was, and the same with the birds and, and the, other, the other critters. And then we, we took various uh, plankton measurements for phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, just getting, getting a, a picture, a sort of a snapshot over a period of several years, but a snapshot of the whole ecosystem of the Arctic. So if you had something that affected some portion of it, you'd have some idea of the ripple effect. Yeah, and we would know where to, and if it was possible to bring it back uh, to what we had to bring it back to. Interesting. So uh, See the pictures you spent nearly three years on and off, I presume going yeah. in and out. <laughs> That's right. Three years. Uh, yep. Three years up there doing that. <laughs> So after that, what? Then I went to uh, Antarctica. I went to the South Pole and I spent 13 months at the South Pole in charge of National Science Foundation atmospheric projects there. Yeah. And that was that was quite an adventure. So you overwintered there, obviously. <laughs> Wintered over. That's right. Uh, yeah, we. We had the we recorded the lowest temperature at the South Pole that had ever been recorded, and it's still a record today. Is 117.8 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Wow. It's that's so cold that carbon dioxide was falling out of the sky like snow. <laughs> From your breath, I, or <laughs> well, no, just you know there is a certain small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and you, we could go out and scoop up. Uh, a bit of the of the fresh fallen snow and analyze it, and some of it was dry ice. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> so we have a whale up here. That's a that's an orca, a killer yeah. whale. Uh, yeah, they they are incredibly friendly critters. There's no record uh, of any orca in the wild ever hurting a human. I've swum with them. I've dove with them. And in, in the uh, second and especially the third uh, of the Mac McDowell mission series, the third one that's just coming out in a couple of weeks called Operation Arctic Sting, uh, an orca plays a significant role. He actually interacts with the humans and, and follows the submarine across the Arctic. Hmm. Interesting. Do we have any more photos that we want to get to? Yeah. There, this is an interesting photo that you're looking at right there. Uh, we were flying uh, over, over the uh, ice, and we noticed two little polar bears running around, and Mama wasn't anywhere. She was probably out hunting. So we landed the helicopter, and uh, at that point, both of the bears ran into a little ice cave, and the pilot, who had on leather gloves and a helmet, uh, he got in the cave and pulled the little polar bear out, teeth and claws. And I want you to take a look at this picture, all of you. Uh, I don't know if you can see anything particularly interesting about it. Uh, I'll give you just a, just a couple seconds here. There's something very special about this picture. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, polar bears don't have wings. Uh, there are no tracks leading to where he was. So that's proof positive that we picked him up and dropped him there. <laughs> so did you ever find Mama? Uh, no, we didn't want to stay around for Mama. Yeah. Mama yeah. would have weighed about 400 pounds and at least, maybe more. And uh, with with our manhandling her pups, uh, she, she, yeah. she would have missed. It's an encounter you don't want. <laughs> yeah. How oh, fun. We, we uh, okay, let me tell you about this one too. Uh, at the South Pole, there is a tradition called the 300 Club. Now, the South Pole, since I was there, they tore down the geodesic dome and they built this new building on stilts that's, that's really, uh, it, it's really a Cadillac of, of a place. It's really sophisticated. Um, and there's a lot more people that winter over there than when I did it. 
there were 17 of us that wintered over for nine months of isolation. Once the temperature stabilized at below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we all of us, uh, well, ha half of the group went into the sauna naked, except for uh, mucklucks, <laughs> and we uh, built up our courage, and then we we built the temperature of the of the sauna up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we ran out of the sauna with a 300 degree temperature drop from 200 plus to minus 100, and ran a quarter <laughs> mile up a little snow slope and around the pole. That that's what you see there, and then back into the sauna, and that's evidence of that happening. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a. Uh, we we had shock. we had two women with us at the club at uh, who wintered over, and the two women happened to be in the group that that I was in. We did it in two groups because one half would line the pathway in case anybody got in trouble, and then the other half would do the would do the uh, three hundred club, and then we reversed it the next day, and the next and and then the other group did it. In any case, nobody got nobody got. Uh, frostbite, except the two women. <laughs> Was there any scientific basis for that? Or <laughs> well, if, if you consider the the uh, the female anatomy, um, as far as the guys were concerned, anything that could have been affected had sucked right up into the body. There yeah, that's no yes. <laughs> okay, that, that makes sense. <laughs> So catch the on eventually. Treatment for a minor frostbite. <laughs> yeah, not a pleasant experience, I imagine. <laughs> okay. Uh, next photo. This pictures the USS Tuthis from Operation Icebreaker, and what you see here is uh, this is this is just. Just behind the, the mountains, that's actually an island uh, at the back of the picture. Behind that is Resolute Bay. Uh, and in, in, this, in, in this particular event, uh, the submarine surfaced to get a satellite fix and to let the guys uh, roam on the ice for a little bit. And uh, a couple of female polar bears and their uh, two cubs apiece, so their four cubs, came to the sub, uh, got on the sub. Uh, it was, and the story, the story details, it's pretty exciting, pretty interesting. Okay. Left some, left some tooth prints in the, in the sub's rudder. Oh. This is, this is yours truly. Uh, I'm in a unisuit wearing an AGA Divator mask. Uh, and that, that, that was, that was what we used primarily for, for diving in the ice flows. You got to be careful doing what's what you see right there, because if those things jostle together, uh, they can squish you. So you, you got to keep an eye out for what's happening. Really, really pay attention when you're doing that. Now you're on you're on tethered during these dives, right? Completely untethered. Yeah. OK, you don't want to get too far under the ice. <laughs> now, the, the image you're seeing there comes from uh, another phase of what I was doing in NOAA. Um, this, was, this was on the uh, NOAA ship uh, Oceanographer. We were down on the equator. This is a box core. Uh, the bottom was five kilometers down where we were. This is a, uh, a steel box with an open bottom that is lowered down to about 10 meters above the bottom. And then gravity takes it down and it penetrates the bottom and then a, a piece closes across the bottom, and you have a piece of the bottom with whatever was there inside the box core, and then it's brought up. What we were studying was the feasibility of mining manganese nodules. And what you see in there is the distribution of manganese nodules at the location we were at. There's, there were, oh. They were all over the ocean That's bottom. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So did, did that turn into something where they were mining them? It, that you know we, of? We established that it's feasible, uh, but it, it's pretty expensive, and the price of manganese isn't high enough to make it economically feasible. Yeah. Okay. 
Now that might be at some future point, but right now it's not. I'll create a, some use for manganese, manganese that makes it a shortage, right? <laughs> yeah. okay. This is called oh. a hero picture. <laughs> so. <laughs> Everybody who goes down to the South Pole gets a, a hero picture. That's, that's me. Uh, you can see the circle of flags that are signatories to the, uh, uh, the Antarctic Treaty. Um, uh, you can see the long shadows. The, the sun is never higher than uh, uh, 23 and a half degrees above the horizon, of course. Okay. So um, I imagine we have some questions probably out there. Um, we have viewers and members, both. Oh, you have a lot of questions coming to you. <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> okay, so the first, first question is, uh, how was the Soviet intel gathered from the cable? Well, uh, it's, we use something called magnetic induction. Uh, the best way to describe it, hmm, as, as, the, as the electronic signals flow through the cable, they create a, a small but detectable magnetic field that varies as the signal varies. And you can use sensitive magnetic coils to pick up that variation and then translate it into a mirror copy of what was in the cable. And interestingly enough, the Soviets were so, uh, were so confident in what they were doing, they didn't bother to encrypt anything in that cable. It, it went from, their, from their, big, um, their, their big submarine base on Kamchatka Peninsula and went all the way across and ultimately down to headquarters. Uh, but a lot of the stuff was, uh, was uh, you know, Ivan talking to his girlfriend or she telling him she was pregnant or whatever, whatever was going on. But it was all in the clear, including top secret stuff. Huh. In fact, one of the things we found, uh, and uh, I'm sure you all remember the, uh, the in, in, Reykjavik, Scott, in, in Reykjavik, Iceland, the summit meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan. Yep. Uh, what Reagan had in his hand that came from our operation was this is for real, a plot to assassinate Gorbachev headed by their equivalent of our joint uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Wow. And Reagan gave this information to Gorbachev, and that's the reason why that meeting abruptly ended, because he had to go back and take care of business. <laughs> Funny they had to get that intel from us. <laughs> Reagan also told him why his latest missile didn't work right, because he had a problem with the guidance system. <laughs> because we had the pieces of it. <laughs> <laughs> so next question, are you still fluent in Vietnamese? I wish I were. <laughs> no, I am not. And, and, and it's too bad because I can, I can understand a bit when I hear it, but I just had no, no opportunity to practice the language. Yeah. And, and, it's too bad. I really wish I had it. With all the growing up overseas that you did, I was going to ask you when you had time to learn English. <laughs> <laughs> I speak German fluently. I'll I bet. Bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, next question is, what does Hollywood get right with submarine diving movies and what does it get wrong? Oh, boy. <laughs> And, and we only have a limited time. <laughs> <laughs> when Jill and I watch a submarine movie, uh, she sits there and laughs at me as I'm screaming at the television. <laughs> uh, they actually do get some, <clears throat> excuse me, they actually do get some things right. In Hunt for Red October, the, the scenes in the, in the submarine uh, with, uh, with Jonesy and what was going on there, that was as accurate as I've ever seen anything in, that Hollywood has produced. Hmm. I, I was really impressed with that. But typically, they just, they just get the whole thing wrong. <laughs> uh, das Boat, which everybody says was such a great movie, it, it's just a bunch of BS. <laughs> 
Good to know. Okay. Those uh, guys would never have passed submarine screening. <laughs> so the next question is a uh, uh, two-part question. Um, what happened during the confrontation with the Soviet divers, and how did they not detect your mission, if that's the case? It's, it's, it's a fairly detailed uh, series of events. They had apparently gotten data that told them we might be down there doing things. Uh, this was in the, uh, this was in the, uh, the missile, the, 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 scattered, the scattered field of missile parts. And they did not have the ability to look down with the ship they were using. What they did was lowered a diving bell. And until the divers got into the water, there was really nothing that they could see. And we detected them using the basketball and the once once the contact was made, obviously they knew what was going on, and what what the mission became at that point was not to let them tell topside what was happening, and so we had to prevent them from communicating back to topside, and to, it would take a long time to discuss the details of it, but it's in the it's in the book, and if you're really interested, you can find it. I'm not pitching the book, but if it, <laughs> it, it takes up a, a full chapter, and and you get the details. So they probably figured out something fishy was going on when they didn't return, but they didn't know what exactly. <laughs> yeah, and what we what we did was to actually sever the cable for the bell so that they couldn't get the bell back. Oh. And we, we had to do it in such a way that, that uh, we would cut off the communications first because there's a communications element and a strength element holding the bell. And it was, it was a tricky operation. Hmm. And it was done on the fly. It, it had to be done as it was happening. We had to think our way through it. Hmm. Okay, so two more questions. Uh, first one is, make sure I understand this. If you were in a submersible that went down into the Marianas Trench and never exited the vehicle, at what pressure would you be subject? What pressure would you be subject to in the vessel? Uh, local depth or ambient pressure or something closer to normal atmospheric? I think I understand the question. It's actually a pretty good question, and it's one that's on people's minds a lot. The, uh, the Trieste, which one of our club members is, as you know, Don Walsh, he took, he took when he was a Navy lieutenant back in 1959 and 1960, the, the Jan December to January of 5960, he took the Trieste to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Uh, the inside of the ball that he was in was at atmospheric pressure. Although if he had had a sensitive uh, pressure measuring device, the ball compressed, and it probably would have raised the pressure maybe a half an atmosphere or so. But in the modern uh, submersibles that have gone to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, basically they're a one atmosphere. There's no reason to have any higher atmosphere. Okay. And then the follow-up question, uh, similarly, uh, what happens in a submarine uh, with pressure? Okay, it's very similar, and I can tell you, Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, the submarine does compress. And one of the things that was fun to do uh, to show the newcomers, the newbies on a sub, uh, as we're ready to go down while we're still on the surface, we take a string and stretch it from one bulkhead, from one external bulkhead to the other, say across the control room, for example. So it's a 30 foot, 33 foot long string, really taut. And then as the submarine goes down, you take it down to a thousand feet, it has a huge catenary in it as the submarine compresses. Huh. Uh, now the, there's an atmospheric, an atmosphere tech, technician who controls the atmosphere continuously. He's looking at oxygen level, carbon dioxide level, 
carbon monoxide levels, and he maintains the atmosphere so that always the oxygen level is between 20 and 21 percent. Uh, carbon monoxide is zero, and carbon dioxide is down near 0 0.004 percent. Okay. Thank you. And I have a I have a question uh, related to what you just said, and um, that's when you when you submerge and you're down there for potentially months, weeks, anyway. Uh, you're not changing air. You're not blowing air out of the sub. How is that all managed? With do you have tanks of oxygen? And there's a lot of recycling going on somehow. <laughs> Yes, and that kind of relates to what I was just saying. Yeah. Uh, we take seawater and distill it to fresh water, and then the fresh water is uh, electrolyzed to produce oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is dumped overboard, and the oxygen is collected and compressed, and then, it's, then the atmosphere technician feeds it into the atmosphere of the submarine to ensure that you continuously have a healthy uh, atmospheric environment. However, that is not what we did on the halibut. The halibut did not have an oxygen generator. So what we did on the halibut was take a whole bunch of what are called oxygen candles with us. An oxygen candle, can, when you light it, will produce about 150 man hours of oxygen. Hmm. So we had, to, we had to carry an awful lot of uh, oxygen candles with us to Produce the atmosphere to produce the op the uh, oxygen that we needed, and we use lithium hydroxide to absorb the carbon dioxide, and we burned the carbon monoxide from cooking and from cigarettes and so on. We burned that into carbon dioxide and then absorbed the carbon dioxide with lithium hydroxide. Hmm. Fascinating. Well, Robert, thank you so much for this. This has been a great talk. I appreciate you coming on. Um, welcome to come back, talk to us again, and look forward to you coming out in June and seeing us. Yeah, I'll be there on June the 3rd, and I really look forward to seeing all you guys. Oh, very good. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. We appreciate you tuning into the show. Uh, if you like what you saw, like the video, subscribe to the channel, tune in every week. We bring you new content, fascinating stories like this. And uh, entertain yourselves, educate yourselves. We have podcasts also, so go out and get these programs on podcasts and listen to them on the way to work and back. It's better than swearing at the guy in front of you on the freeway. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs>